Living Life Juicy podcast. Conversations with interesting people you should know. Welcome to the Living Life Juicy podcast. This is where we explore how we can be present and kind as we do great things. I'm your host and guide, John Losey. If you're interested in video resources on and insights on how people learn and grow and how groups develop, I've got another podcast called Growing People, and it's all part of the Into Wisdom Group. If you want to learn more about that, go to intowisdomgroup.com. Uh, be sure, of course, all the uh, uh, podcast stuff. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this with other people so more people can uh, see what we're doing here. Today, I am honored to have as a guest, uh, Mitch Ferris. I was introduced to Mitch over three years ago as we explored how to use video platforms to engage our clients in new ways. I've come to have tremendous respect and appreciation for, for Mitch's abilities as a facilitator and as a consultant, but also for his compassion and heart as a human. Uh, a little background, he's the president and founder of On The Mark Learning Experience Company and active in the nonprofit world as a founding board member of Socks for Souls in Canada. This is a nonprofit volunteer organization committed to contributing warmth, comfort, and dignity uh, and really working with the uh, homeless people and providing them with new socks. What a practical way to support and love people. I'm excited to have Mitch join me today. I'll let him tell more about who he is and what he does. But in the meantime, welcome, Mitch. John, thank you for having me. Nice to have you in front of me on, you know, what I think of as my screen. I'm actually on your screen. <laughs> uh, well, well, I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, throughout the past couple of years, we've had a chance to engage in a group and a community, but we've also had, I think, some amazing conversations, just <clears> you <throat> and me. And I think, you know, you you rely on me for the video stuff, but I've had a chance to watch you do your thing in facilitating virtually and how you interact with your clients. And man, I've learned a ton from that. But I want to hear from you. So if you're at like a, a cocktail party and says, oh, Mitch, what do you do? How do you answer that? And I'll also maybe follow it up with, what does your wife say when, when they ask, oh, what does Mitch do? So, <laughs> what do you do? Oh, man, I am usually long winded when I try and explain what it is I do. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I, I am someone who corporations tend to call on when they've got significant challenges. If I were to try and bucket it in some ways that people could get their arms around it and understand, I would probably say I do five different things. And the first thing I do is I spend a lot of time helping people get on the same page with one another. Because in most places, people do not see things eye to eye. And I often get called in to help either executives on a senior leadership team or departments, sometimes uh, whole countries within a corporation, be able to see things in a way that they can work together with greater ease and less friction. And often I am the person when there is conflict or there is dissonance, that they say, Mitch, can you come in with the bag of magic dust and sprinkle it over the people and help them play nice together? And I have some tremendously good process that allows me, believe it or not, to do just that. I performed, I think, what I might consider some minor miracles in taking parties that are like this and getting them to actually not only work together well, but literally grow appreciation and respect for one another. So that's one of the things I do. And apart from doing that for corporations, I also teach those skills in a variety of programs that I offer. So that's kind of the first big bucket of things that I do. Uh, the second one is, uh, I'm just going to say in a straightforward manner, uh, a bunch of leadership development. And I tend to do a lot of work with senior leadership teams, which means presidents and CEOs of very large corporations, many of the names you would know, um, and their immediate teams. So often those are teams of anywhere from six to 11 people. And, uh, you know, when it comes to senior leadership teams, uh, they're like any other group. It's not easy for any group of a half a dozen to a dozen people to land on the same page, to run an entire 
enterprise together. And so often I am asked to come in and help build synergies that allow them to run an organization uh, with greater ease. And you know, the other thing I'll say is most senior leadership teams uh, will tell you that they are teams. And you know, when I get in, I start to talk to people, do a bunch of interviews, get to get the lay of the land. I recognize and will tell them, hey, um, I'm not so sure you're what I would call a team. It seems to me that instead you are a bunch of functional leaders who happen to have meetings together. But as a yeah, team- you work in proximity with each other. <laughs> exactly. Like it's just like, okay, you guys have meetings together, but you're really focused on your functions and not the whole enterprise. Like, let's figure out how to make you work as a team to run the enterprise as a whole. So, you know, I get to do a lot of interesting work with uh, senior executive teams and I do a lot of leadership development at all levels in the organizations that I work with. Um, <clears throat> the third thing that I would say I do a great deal of with or work in a fair bit is what I'll call what's possible thinking. And uh, what I'll tell you is uh, 20 years, 25 years ago, I was coming back from a session I ran north of Toronto where I live. We were in a car, we're driving back home and someone said, what's the next program we're going to create? And we started to talk about like, what's all the hot topic of the day might be, you know, what, what's, what's really big right now. And it dawned on me, I went, wait a minute, let's not do that. What are we passionate about? And we started a conversation around many people who had been at the end of their careers or at the end of their lives and hadn't gotten everything they wanted out of their lives or their careers. So we designed a program called what's possible. And in its, uh, you know, most succinct definition. It's just about getting more of the things you want out of your life. And that includes, of course, your business life. And it gets used a lot in my corporate clients because in most places, every year, they are asking for the stretch goals. They want more this year than last year. I don't know any place that does it. And ironically, at this point in time, so often that's accompanied by this second sentiment, which is, oh, and by the way, the budget is smaller or your headcount is going to be less. Like right. we want this much more, but we'd like you to do it with 85% of what you had last year. And what we do is we build like real buy-in for the ability to do more in a year amongst those who are being asked to do that without having to work harder, be ground up in the machine. Because we know that in most organizations, when that, that ask comes every year, people nod their heads and go, yep, yep, I'm there. And then they go home to their significant other and they say, honey, you'll never believe what they're asking of us now. And, you know, how do you build real buy-in? So I get organizations coming, coming to me and saying, Mitch, how do we build buy-in for the stretch endeavors? And we've got some really beautiful process to help build real buy-in without leaving the people have to get the work done, feeling ground in the machine to get that work done. It's not about more hours, more pressure, more stress. It's about working differently. So that's kind of the third bucket. <clears throat> the fourth bucket is, you know, what I'll simply call team building and the ability to build cohesive teams that work at their best and work at their best with and through the others on their team. Uh, you and I both know from all our client work that teams don't work easily all by themselves. Uh, it takes some effort. It takes some wisdom. And uh, we have a bunch of experiences because much of what I do is experiential in nature that people go through and in simulated environments, see in the mirror how their behaviors impact their productivity, their satisfaction, their ability to get along with uh, other parts of the company that they need to deal with. And in that process, we end up giving them the opportunity to choose to behave in a bunch of ways that differ and get better results when they're working in a team fashion, whether it's within themselves or cross-functionally. And the final thing that I'll say that I, I spend a lot of my work life on is coaching. I am an executive coach. I Right now, I think about, I think I have seven executives on my roster at this moment in time, but I also teach coaching skills. And uh, I have a, what I just think is a very unique approach to coaching different than most people might imagine. Um, so those would be the big buckets. So we're talking, yeah. getting on the same page with one another, what's possible thinking, leadership development, and a lot of executive leadership team work. We're talking coaching and we're talking team building. How's that for long-winded? 
By yeah, now. and now, now let me get the real answer, and we can call call your wife in and ask her what you do. Uh, she what, would say, what would she say? She would say he's really good at talking to people. And he's really good at influencing people to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. And that would be pretty much what she would say, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what you do. How did you get here? I love exploring like the different paths. Uh, if you're into the the different comic book things of orange origin stories is big. And I want to, how was the path that got you to doing these five buckets or so, to being long winded and influential? <laughs> I fell into it. Uh, so I was working uh, most recently before starting this company at a company called Royal Trust, which at the time was Canada's largest trust company. We had a little over 400 personal and commercial branches. And I was the hired gun to build a sales culture across those 400 branches. And so um, that was before they were gobbled up by the Royal Bank, which is one of the big five banks here in Canada. And at that time, every financial institution on the planet, and to some degree, it's still like this, um, is looking to move from any level of uh, reactive order taking to being really proactive and creating a true sales culture and making things happen, making sales happen is really what they're hoping for. So I had a um, unique opportunity to be uh, uh, asked to come and do that for a relatively large, or large organization. Now, about a year into my time, there when I was just starting to have like tremendous success and getting lots of recognition. Uh, the woman who hired me in, who was a director within the organization, said to me that she had been bypassed for a senior vice president's um, position. And it was the second time in that year she had bypassed as she applied for a, an SVP position. And she had been a director there for six years. She had been a director at American Express for six years prior to that. And in both cases, she couldn't find her way beyond director level. And she felt at that point in time that there was a real gender uh, gender ceiling, if you will. And this is a long time ago. And in fact, there was a gender ceiling. So she said, you know what? <clears throat> I don't want to play this game anymore. I'm out of here. And I was about to wish her well. And she said, well, I'm going to go start a little training company. And I went, okay, great. Good for you. And she said, no, no, no. I, I could really use a partner. <clears throat> and then I realized she was looking in my direction. <laughs> and we had worked really well together. She had strengths where I didn't. I had some strengths where she didn't. And I said, give me a week. Uh, I'm going to take some, some vacation time. Let me come back and think about it. This was huge for me. I'm inside a corporation. I'm doing well. I've got a job I love. And someone's mm -hmm. saying, hey, why don't we go and do this instead? Um, so I went to the Bahamas and I sat on the beach for a week. And I came back and I said, let's do it. Now, six years later, we went our separate ways. But if it hadn't been for her holding my hand out the door, I probably would never have made it into this world. And in the early days, we thought we would focus on sales, sales management, and customer service, which were things that we had lots of experience in. And we had come across a little company outside of Toronto that was doing some really cool experiential exercises. And they were, at the time, a one-man shop working out of their basement. They're now a big global company. And we convinced them to let us use some of their products as door openers because we knew there were a million people doing, you know, sales, sales management, customer service focused endeavors. So let's get something that differentiates us and we'll get in the door with these cool simulations and then they'll get to know and love us. And then, you know, they'll use us for what we're really here for. Well, six months into that, we were having fun. We were making money. Clients were saying this is some of the best training and simulations we've ever experienced. And we looked at each other and said, why do we want to do, you know, all this stuff in the sales realm? Why don't we continue focusing on, you know, at the time we thought games and simulations. So we became uh, an experiential company at first uh, using only the one vendor that we first came across and then running into a couple more. And then uh, when uh, my original partner and I went our separate ways, I started to scan the globes for the rest of the best designers, you know, I could find any place on the planet. And we started to, to license some really amazing programs. And then over the years, 
I had gained enough expertise. I started to design my own program. So now much of what we do, you know, is stuff that I've had the opportunity to, to, to design either by myself or with others, but there's still some great uh, simulations and some programs that I license. Yeah. So I want to step back to before you were brought in to be the hired gun doing the sales stuff. Oh, okay. How did you get to the point where a large corporation would say, Mitch, <laughs> we want you to be our hired gun to go and work on this stuff? How did you yeah. get to that point? Oh, man. So it was a very convoluted path. So I came out of university with an undergrad degree and nothing more. And I had great marks and confounded my professors when I said, hey, I'm not going into anything business-wise. I'm going to go become a racquetball pro. And I was very active on the racquetball scene. I was playing competitively. I was traveling all, all over North America playing tournaments. Um, I had taken a job originally at a local racquetball club in Windsor, which is where I grew up. And I was the club pro and I was managing leagues and managing the ladders. And then I was offered another job at another Windsor-based club, uh, which was much larger and it had tennis and squash and, uh, you know, racquetball and swimming pool and restaurant. And, and I became the night manager there. And then I got a, a tap on the shoulder from an organization in Toronto that was growing uh, broadly. And they said, would you like to become the club pro at our club in Scarborough, which is a, a suburb of Toronto? So I went there as a club pro. I ran a bunch of leagues and and a, ran the, the ladders and you know, I lived and breathed that club industry, but within two months there, they they offered me the chance to run two clubs, become the club manager for two clubs in Montreal. So I went to Montreal and I ran two clubs there. And then within a year, they said, come back to Toronto, Mitch. We've got three clubs we want you to run here. Um, and then the most interesting thing happened. Um, <clears throat> two of the three clubs I were, was running were not making money. And this was back in the day when there was a, a racket and fitness club on every street corner. And it was an interesting world because they were competing like mad. And here's what they were doing. They would try and undercut pricing. So members would come to them from the neighboring clubs. And then the next club would undercut that. And it was like a downward spiral. And they kept moving people around the board in terms of move to club, to club, to club, taking less money all the way through. So it was a losing game. Anyway, at some point, I realized two of my clubs weren't going to make it financially, and I was the operations manager. I reported to the president, so my job was to run these things, and they two of them were not successful. So uh, we talked about closing those two clubs, and in those were back in the days when you could close a racket club put a sign on the door and say, sorry, members, you're out of luck. And you know that was it. And I couldn't right. live like that. I like, it just went like, I can't do it. So I told the guy who was the president of all these clubs, I said, listen, I'll close the clubs, but I need to be able to do a couple of things. And the most important thing is I need to be able to reallocate the members someplace else without any cost to them. And he almost laughed at me and said, yeah, you could try. So I went to other clubs in the Toronto area where these two clubs were, and I had no problem finding takers for the membership. And they'd honor the remaining time on the memberships that we had because they wanted the renewals when the they want to make the sell. Yeah. 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 So, you know, even though the first thought, like no one had ever done that before, I went like, let me try. And it was so easy. It was like unbelievable. And the guy who had laughed at me a week earlier is going, oh, my goodness, it's really happening. I go, yeah, we can we can allocate them and, and there'll be no one that's out. So um, I had successful reallocations. We closed those two clubs and then suddenly the phone started to ring and it were they were other clubs that were in financial trouble because there were so many clubs and everyone and his brother thought how easy it is to run a club. You know, we'll put some fitness equipment in, we'll get some courts and we'll just open the doors and we'll charge money and this will be easy. Well, everyone was losing money and everyone was looking to unload. Like you could buy a club for a dollar in the early eighties, like literally like give me a dollar and take this mess off my hand was the sentiments you'd find all over. So I ended up closing what was called the Wingfield Club north of Toronto, the Penn Club in St. Catharines, which is on the other side of Toronto. And uh, I continue to um, do the, the very unpleasant things. The Putting members in other clubs was the easy part. 
but I would have to uh, fire all the staff. I would end up selling off all the equipment. I would deal with the media. And when I was closing the St. Path uh, Catherine's Club, it is a UAW town, so the auto workers, and most of the members were auto workers. And I was this guy from Toronto that they saw coming in to close the club, and they didn't recognize me as the messenger. They thought I was the problem. So, Mama, I'm making that decision. And one day I exit the club, and I'm literally surrounded by about 20 UAW workers who were quite upset with me. And um, I don't think talking was the only thing they had in mind. Now, of course, I had the ability to talk through that and talk them down. And I get out of that evening going, this is nuts, Mitch. Like you are playing doctor to the dying and you just about got in a scrape there and like not good. Uh, and like, let me out of this. Uh, and the other thing that was happening at the time was because I was becoming known for the guy who was closing clubs. If I had friends who ran clubs and I played racquetball or squash with them, they'd all say, Mitch, could we play at your club? Because when people see you here walking through the hallways, man, it sends all the wrong messages. So like not fun at all at that stage. So at that point, um, I had the good opportunity to go to Harry Rosen, which was a, um, a men's retailer, a uh, high-end me men's retailer, like Louis in Boston used to be, or Barney's in New York used to be. And a uh, long time ago, uh, I'm talking decades ago, we were selling suits for three and $4,000 a suit several decades ago. Like we're talking really yeah. high-end. Uh, you know, I had movie stars as clients who would fly into town and buy buy expensive garments from me. Uh, from there, um, I also did a little radio work. I uh, worked as a sales manager for a community radio station. Um, but I eventually got recruited out of Harry Rosen, the, the men's clothier, to Royal Trust because Royal Trust, when they were looking for someone to build a sales culture, was looking to retail and they're going like retail is really good at building a sales culture. So I got headhunted out of Royal Trust because of my retail experience. So that's what got me into Royal Trust before, you know, a year into Royal Trust, I stepped out with my then partner into this world of at, at that time, corporate trading. So a couple of follow-up things. Um, <laughs> having been in, I mean, how competitive were you as a, a racquetball pro? Did you go to tournaments? Was it, or was it just contained in that, in your club? So I was a, a national champion at a low level. So I was a C player national champion. So of all the C players in the country, I was lowest. And then eventually I, I played B and I played A and I never really cut it as an open player. I played at an open level here and again, and I would always get killed. So I hit my peak you know, I was just below the guys who were really good at the sport. So I was a notch down. And, uh, you know, I did that for a bunch of years, really enjoyed it. Uh, but but you, were, you were in the competitive realm. And what I found oh. is that um, <clears throat> people who go there, and this is true, like, and in, when I worked at a college and I ran in real sports and made the mistake of allowing, like, the, the women's uh, soccer team to create a flag football team or the yeah. mint and these that were intercollegiate athletes stepping into intramural <laughs> and they just had a different switch and people like the regular students would play against them and they get hurt, even though it was flag football or whatever it was. Yeah. And I think, and this, I see this constantly with people who have experience competing at a high level, regardless if they are champions or not, there's a different switch in them. How do you think competing at that level impacted how you do what you do now? Um, so I would say uh, there'd be two things that come to mind right off the bat. To be able to compete at that level, I had to practice and practice and practice. So I dedicated my uh, non-playing time to practice. So literally, well, my peers would often take summers off because it, it was typically... Uh, what we would perceive in Canada, where it's a little colder, a winter sport where, you know, everything would happen between September and May. Uh, I would now take June, July, August, and I would be in the courts for several hours a day practicing. I would hit the same shot like 3000 times a day until the point where it was just mental muscle memory that would get me there. Um, when it came to uh, 
the regular season, I would always be the guy who would, when, when the matches were over, go back on the court and keep practicing for a while longer. So it was that, that ability to practice and prepare. And that's carried with me to this day, that ability um, to be really prepared for anything I do generally serves me. And I'm a guy who probably goes to a fault, like beyond what makes sense in terms of preparation for anything I do. I think it serves me. Others would look at me and go, man, I'm not sure that that's necessary, but that is my wiring for sure. And, and the other thing I'd say is just the ability to realize you can start from nowhere. Cause I started like not being able to play and suddenly finding myself playing just below the guys who were playing open uh, in a very short period of time. It took me two years to make it from like barely could hit the ball to playing guys who were, were open players. And it gave me confidence that no matter what I stepped into, I could handle it. I could do well. Uh, I have a, an unreasonable belief in myself because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So another part from that pre-world that you were in. Um, so you went from being the club killer to like, then you go, forget this. I'm going to get in the sales. You did sales and that turned into something different as well. How did that experience early on of having to uh, bring the bad news and process things that were hard and difficult, how does that impact how you work with leaders and organizations? What what do you what what do you transfer from that? Uh, that was my uh, definite initiation and definitely my boot camp for all the difficult stuff that I do now. Um, you know, you know that some of my programs include having difficult conversations and teaching the skills to do that. Uh, so in the club world, uh, when someone said, Mitch, we want you to take this club and we want you to close it. I knew that usually there were 50 to 75 people whose livelihood depended on that club. And I would be the person breaking the news to them. And that was brutally difficult. Um, it was heartbreaking. Uh, and I, at that time, didn't have that skill set when I started. By the by, the time I had made it through a couple club closures, my skill set ramped up. Uh, the ability to do it with empathy, the ability to, um, you know, not prolong bad news and make people wonder, you know, what's going to happen here. You know, those kind of skills came very quickly. Um, the toughest one for me was literally when I opened two clubs in Montreal before I became the club killer, um, I had been given a job that had previously been failed by the guy who was managing me. So he didn't make those clubs turn around the way that the organization I work for hoped. And they canned him and they said, Mitch, you're in. And I'm like, oh man. And I got there and the clubs were really clubs where the members had run of the roost so if you wanted something at the pro shop you didn't necessarily have to pay for it you could just mark it on a sheet and leave it there that you had taken a new racket and you know you never knew when you'd get paid for it if you wanted five towels instead of two one for your feet one for your hair one for your body you just took five towels and you know there were so many practices that we looked at and went oh my goodness like this thing bleeds money for a reason so I was the person trying to put in reasonable policies like, yeah, we're going to two or three towels, not five per person. Uh, we need you to pay for things when you take it out of the pro shop. Uh, we need you to show your membership card when you come past the front desk. So we know you're a member and not just waltz by and have someone go, no, 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 I'm fine. Um, so because they had such leeway prior to my arrival, I seemed like the bad guy. Uh, like, who is this? And I was young. Like, who is this young whippersnapper who is now instilling policy and ruining our experience? And we had town halls uh, where I would say, OK, I know there's a bunch of concern. And I would gather in front of several hundred members in the lounge of our club or the kitchen area or the restaurant area in our club. And it was more like a town lynching than a town hall. Like, yeah. they just... They just didn't want to hear anything I had to say. Like I was just, so I grew very quickly 
able to realize I could get through horrendous circumstances where people had nothing but insults and not good things to say to me and about me. Uh, and by being thrown in the deep end like that in a place where I had no experience, let's just say my skin toughened uh, quickly and I learned a bunch of skills. Well, and I think as you know, when you're dealing with clients and stuff like that, oftentimes consultants can veer away from telling the hard truth because they, they risk their client. I'm actually, I've got a proposal in with an organization that's been trying to do a strategic plan for, I don't know how long, it's maybe even over a year. And they keep coming back. Well, we're too busy. We're too busy. We can't maybe next week or maybe next month or next quarter. And I have a proposal in, so I don't even have their business yet. And yet I feel the need to say, hey, I understand a busy schedule. And what makes you think that it's going to be any different at the start of next quarter? Because it hasn't been for the last three. And, yeah. and telling that hard truth of saying, the reason why you want to do this is important, but you're not going to be willing to interrupt your current flow in order to get it done. And you're, you know, you're circling the drain. <laughs> and like for in your situation, I worked in clubs too. So I know what you're talking about. The, 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 that ritzy member who wants to just float in and you're the young kid behind the counter going, no, no, no. got to show me your card. And they get all entitled. Um, yeah. But I think, I mean, as I listen to you tell that story and I see as we've, I've had a chance to produce for you and like back you up on some things, you being able to take that risk of offending people for their own good. Yeah. Such I, an important piece whenever like you're working as a consultant or a coach. It's super interesting. I'll, I'll say two things. Number one is um, I work with a lot of colleagues who are afraid to ask for what they need from a client to do the best job possible. And I'll get uh, colleagues will say, well, we can't ask for three more microphones. I go, would it serve us to do that? Would it serve them? They go, yeah, but but they're not going to want the budget for three more microphones. Or, you know, that room that they provide us isn't going to be ideal. Let's ask them for a different room. No, we don't want to inconvenience them, you know, a month ahead of the thing. And I'm going, I'm the guy always willing to inconvenience the client to get them a better result. Because what I recognize is when the session is done, they go, that was amazing. That did incredible things for us. That moved the needle for our people. They're going to be thinking about the result. They're not going to go, oh, two months ago, he bothered us to change the rooms. That's not going to be on their mind anymore. So in right. the moment, will I upset a client in the moment to get a greater outcome for them and know that that stuff is going to become way in the rearview mirror? I'm yeah. usually that guy. I'm willing to you know, tip the apple cart a bit to get you know, <laughs> them a better result. Um, and I don't see why not. You know, you know what you were saying earlier about... Uh, uh, being able to tell the, the 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 real truth and the difficulty in doing that to, and people accepting the real truth. I have a colleague in Hungary. Uh, his name is Pepe. And Pepe has a really interesting line that always stuck with me. And he said, Mitch, people will always prefer the um, acceptable lie rather than the unacceptable truth. And I went, yeah, super interesting. They want to hear what's easy to hear, not what's difficult to hear. But, you know, he would say that and I go, wow, that's very true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's our job. I think about like afterwards, my when I'm coaching clients, what they'll say is that, well, John always told me the stuff I didn't want to hear. And it was wonderful. And I think that's part of both coaching and, and consulting. Um, and when you're talking about like asking for the room stuff, I've learned for the longest time, I was the guy that say, wow, they backed out. John, can you do something tomorrow? And I prided <laughs> myself in almost the MacGyver approach of, hey, throw me in a room yep. and I'll make it work and it'll be spectacular. But I learned when I was started doing corporate stuff of the importance of if you have the time and the resources, ask for what you get and you take control of the room that you're given or change the room. Too many people just walk in and accept what's there as opposed to saying, let's move the tables. Yeah. Um, I, let, let, let's get this to a space that's going to create the environment that's needed to get the job done. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm with you. There's something nice to be able to say, give me any set of circumstances. I can make it work. And I uh, buy into that credo and I, I try and live into that credo to some degree, but I am also at the same time, the guy who will try and manipulate every variable I possibly can to get the good outcome. Like if I think something is going to make a, a slight difference in the outcome we can get, 
believe me, I will not be shy to ask for that. So I, and you know, you could say, and this would be accurate that I am a control freak to some degree, particularly when it comes to client sessions, because I'm going, if you can give me this, this, and this, and this circumstance, we can do it at this time. And it, like, man, just like set us up to win. Let's, let's manipulate the environment. Let's manipulate the variables so we get the best possible result. Yeah. And I was just talking with a facilitator friend today, Mike, uh, intentionally provocative statement when I'm training facilitators or, or presenters or educators, we're all manipulators. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let them gasp at me and say, you know, accuse me of bad things. But the difference is what we manipulate. I can't tell you what the line is, but if you're gifted, you're manipulating the environment and the situation and the context. You're not manipulating their behaviors or the people. Yeah. And where that falls in there, I'm not sure, but I think there is a line that a, that a lot of people cross where they're manipulating the people to get the outcomes versus manipulating the environment to help the people get the outcomes. Uh, I think you said it precisely right. Yeah. So I do want to get, tell me about the socks. Okay. Tell all the these people out here, the dozens of people watching, <laughs> tell me about the socks. Uh, so 2015. <clears throat> I have a client who's become a friend. His name is Rick Fitzgerald and Rick ran Diageo. And Diageo is a liquor company and you would know their brands. It would be Jose Cuervo, it would be Johnny Walker. At some point they bought Guinness. Anyway, you walk into a local dining establishment or a local bar and you look at all the brands on the back of the bar and about 40% of those are probably gonna be Diageo brands. And so Rick had retired as he had been the president CEO in Canada, he had been the president and CEO in the US and he was retiring. And I had done a bunch of work for him at Diageo. And so once he retired, I thought, man, let's have lunch together. I'd love to know what you're gonna do now with the rest uh, of your life, the next couple chapters. And so we sat down at lunch at, at a little local joint. Uh, and uh, I said, Rick, so what are you gonna do now? And Rick pulled out his iPhone and he had a list of 10 good things on his iPhone. And they went everywhere from pulling young women out of the brothels in India to going up in Northern Canada where you know much of the in indigenous population lived through the winters on generators and you know, you're burning oil. And, and he's saying like, we could get wind and solar. And of his 10 things, all those kinds of things, one of them was put socks on the feet of the homeless. And I said, well, tell me about that one. Uh, and he said, well, you know, sometimes you see a homeless person walking kind of what looks like tipsy on the sidewalk and immediately think they've had too much to drink. And he goes, often it's because their feet are so messed up, they can't walk properly. He said, sometimes you'll see a homeless person sitting in the same spot on the sidewalk day in, day out, looking for money. And you think how lazy they are. And in fact, they're not mobile. Their feet are so messed up. They can't get up from that spot. They can barely make it from wherever shelter they might be living into that spot every night. Yeah. Uh, I've, and, I've been to libraries where we would give the service of clipping toenails. Yep. And you'd peel the socks off that haven't been changed in months. And they're walking generally, not because of the drinking or drugs or anything like that, but their toenails are digging into their feet. Yeah, exactly. So they get all sorts of foot problems. I mean, we're talking, we're talking like frostbite, trench foot, like you name it. Like there's a whole bunch of diseases. And the thing that we learn, and, and I, you know, as I started to talk to Rick about this, and you know, my wife's a physician. So we, over the first few months, we realized that the number one medical problem that homeless people have is their feet. Like those are the most medical. Like they go to a hospital for a problem. Often it's foot related. Mm -hmm. So when Rick pulled out this list and he started to explain what the problem was, and it was just like putting new socks on the feet of the homeless, I went, man, I think we could do something about it. He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, let's pull together a group of friends. So we pulled together a group of five friends a week later around a, a, a restaurant uh, meal. And we said, let's, let's get underway. Let's do this. And we originally were thinking like, kitchen table endeavor, like small scale. And we were thinking over the next year, we'd collect and distribute 10,000 pairs of socks. So our ambitions were eh, quite small. And within three days, three days, 
we had collected and distributed 900 pairs of socks. Wow. And then within a month or two, I think, I can't recall exactly, we had a sock manufacturer donate 33,000 pairs of socks. And we were horrified because we were thinking like, this is small scale, we'll do this in our part time. And now suddenly we're in the business of loading docks and transport trucks, like 33,000. Right. That's pallets and pallets of socks. Like we went, oh my goodness, like what are we going to do with this? And so we launched and <clears throat> we now have, let's see, eight years later, we have distributed over 1 million pairs of socks, put them on the feet of the homeless. They're all new socks. This is not used socks. This is all brand new socks. Um, we have uh, a very sophisticated board, some physicians, some business people, uh, just a lovely group of people who make it happen. Uh, we have had the benefit of working with a local Toronto radio station called Indy 88, who every year have, uh, for the last five years, I believe, have run a Socks for the Street campaign. And they end up doing, for the month of December, when things are starting to get very cold here, they're running an on-air promotion. And we have uh, places in uh, major shopping malls in the Toronto area where they will broadcast live from and people will drop off socks and people come and donate money. And they will invite bands, local bands, because they are an indie radio station uh, to compete against one another. And what I mean by that is this band says, listen, we'll, we'll give you enough money for 200 pairs of socks. And we challenge this other band to top that. And the other band says, we'll get you money for 400 pairs of socks. And now we challenge this band. And, you know, it goes like this. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you if you're curious about what this is, you can go to Socks4Canada.com. Socks and for find souls. out more about this stuff. What's yeah. that? Socks for Socks souls. For souls, Canada. Socks uh, soul. for souls, Canada.com. And the souls is S O U L S. Cause some people think it's, you know, going to be socks for yeah. souls. the soul <laughs> of their foot. Yeah. 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 But I love the fact that just paying attention to the dignity of people and as simple as man, socks can make a huge difference. And it truly is not about their feet. It's about their soul. Yeah. So I want to, I like to end with doing a lightning round. And what that means is I'll ask a question. I want first thing off your mind, off of your mind. It's not like you're signing a lifelong contract to your answer, but just what do you think? And um, do a couple of questions. Give me the first thing that comes to mind and we'll see where it goes. So you ready? I think so. <laughs> yeah. So here's what, um, what is your favorite book? And I'll put in media to give us a gift. Uh, favorite book to give as a gift. Um, Ogmandino's The Greatest Salesman in the World. Um, for those who um, don't have an appetite for religion, there's a, a religious overtone. Uh, but uh, no matter what your view is as you read the book, the major messages of the book are profoundly good. So it is amongst a handful of books that if someone says, what should I read? I go, um, you know, the greatest salesman in the world is, you know, right up there. Yeah, it's great to have those right up top of your head. Now, next one. And I've modified this question. I used to ask, who are your heroes? But a lot of people today can't point to one person. So I've modified it. If you were going to assemble a hero, what parts from which people would you use to assemble your hero? Oh, man. So I'm going to start with my father. Uh, okay. My father uh, was a very simple guy. So he uh, worked for a company that filled vending machines with sandwiches and candy bars and things like that. And those vending machines were in factories and he did the midnight shift. So he would go in in the middle of the night and he would fill vending machines in the factories. And because he didn't make a lot of money, he had a day job and he drove the truck that supplied the paper boy. So there's this big truck and there's a guy on the back who would throw stacks of paper on street corners where the paper boys would pick them up to deliver them. So he did those two things. Yeah. He was um, one of those people that everyone loved. Uh, the cliche is true for him. He would give you the shirt off his back. He would help in any way possible. Uh, he was easygoing. 
uh, very difficult to have him anything other than in a good mood in a positive way. Uh, so uh, his demeanor uh, would be one component of my hero. Um, there, there's another one, uh, a fellow by the name of Brady Wilson, who's a colleague of mine, uh, works in a company that I collaborate with a lot. And Brady is uh, someone who is calm in demeanor, uh, deeply inquisitive, um, always wants to know uh, what's really behind something, doesn't take the cliche answers at face value and helps people dig deeper to see you know, greater meaning, greater opportunity behind what otherwise might be mundane views of life. So he's really good at getting people to think deeply because he brings um, a true sense of inquiry, uh, a beautiful skill set that he brings. Um, let's see, beyond that, uh, I think those are the only two yeah. that come to mind. Well, those, those are, are great qualities to have in a hero. I hear you know, generosity and easygoing and calm, inquisitive, and helps people find depth. Yep. Those are good qualities to have in a, in a hero. Um, one more thing, um, maybe two, but we'll see how, how this goes. Okay. What is one thing that you have rethought or changed your mind about recently? Oh. <laughs> I steal that from Adam Grant, so give credit where credit is. Oh, you. Adam Grant, who I love. Um so uh, there are a bunch of things. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, the easy one and the most dangerous one, and that is politics, and particularly U.S. politics, as we on the sidelines here in Canada watch your politics. Uh, our politics is getting wonky, too, but we watch the divisiveness in on your side of the border. Mm -hmm. And we are horrified sometimes. At first, we were amused, and then we went, wow, this is not amusing at all. This is not good. And we hear the talk about them. And I go, well, you're not talking about Americans anymore. You're talking about the other party. And I'm going, yikes. And I I lean one way. Uh, you know, you would paint me on one side of that fence. And I have, in the recent year or two, started to think about maybe the other side has way more sensibility than I might have initially given credit to. And I need to listen with bigger ears to both sides of the equation. So now where there are political views that are uh, very like here versus here, I'm going, let me listen carefully because there's probably something of real value on both sides and I'm not as quick to go, oh my goodness, here we go again. The other yeah. thing I've, yeah. So the other thing I've changed my mind on uh, would be uh, largely around my nutrition. Uh, I am a guy in his late sixties, uh, and you know, I'm thinking about longevity and I was a guy who was leaning heavily towards plant-based for a while. And I would only eat meat on occasion. I would tell you, I don't need much meat in my diet. And I joined a gym that ran something called the metabolic challenge. And inside of that, they looked at my diet. And I went on a six week program where I ate nothing but protein and vegetables and transform my muscle mass, dropped 13 pounds and felt better throughout. And now I eat probably five times as much meat as I ever did before. So I've changed my mind on, you know, from meat being not a good thing for you to meat being an absolute must in my diet if I want to stay alive for a long time. Now, who knows? what I'll say in two years from now, but right. I have swung from one side of the pendulum way over here. That's why I say you don't sign a lifelong contract to your answers here. Yeah. Okay. I want to do one more just because if something comes to your mind, I want to know it. Um, okay. <laughs> who do you find yourself quoting most often? It can be an author. It could be a movie, a leader, but what quote do you pull out of your pocket most time? Or what's the one top of mind right now? So uh, Charlie Munger, who recently died, who is Warren Buffett or was Warren Buffett's lifelong partner in business, uh, is someone who I really love. And, uh, you know, when uh, you listen to Charlie Munger, uh, he just sounds like a very sensible guy. 
And the quote that sticks out for me, and I don't think I'll get it right on, is um, he said basically, when he's talking about him and Warren and Berkshire Hathaway, he says, we're not trying that hard to do really smart things. We're just working hard not to do really dumb things. And that that appealed to me. Um, yeah. There's another quote, and I, I won't get the author. I could probably look it up and find the author, but his name is Charlie something or other, I believe. And he was asked about inspiration. And his response to inspiration was one of my favorites. He said, oh, inspiration, that's for amateurs. The rest of us just get up and go to work. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love that quote too. And it catches, like I've had, I know some very, like the big entrepreneurial uh, influencers and all that kind of stuff. And I say, you know what? And and I know artists who get paid for the work and that's where it comes from is an artist. If you're going to be a paid artist, you can't wait for inspiration to hit you. <laughs> You've got to eat. And so you have to find the discipline that's why it's not, it, it doesn't say inspiration is bad. It just, if you, if you don't have to uh, rely on your creativity for income, yeah, that's why it's for amateurs. <laughs> so, and, and I would say habit trumps inspiration every time. I mean, you, you hear every famous writer say, yeah. Hey, listen, uh, the, different versions of this, but I get up, I go to my typewriter and I sit there for five hours, whether I write two words or I write four chapters, I know that you know, that discipline of sitting in front of the typewriter for five hours every day, that's what yields the book, not when I get inspired to write. Well, and and I would go even to say that habit trumps discipline. You have like a lot of the stuff that's coming out, especially with military background, all that kind of stuff, discipline, discipline, discipline. Well, <laughs> we didn't all go through basic training, which ins instilled the habits that created discipline. Right. And discipline, if doing the the work to create the di the, the habit, will create the discipline yeah um so but mitch we're running out of time here and i want to thank you so much for taking the time with me and i appreciate the time the, i mean all that you've done for me in the past couple of years and also just your insights here well john my pleasure like uh, you know i love any time that you and i get a chance to chat and it's it's less frequent these days. So I'm happy that you reached out and said, Mitch, let's do this. So really happy. Thanks for this conversation. Um, I'm sure I'll see you in the not too far future. Be present and kind as you do great things.